بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم أحسن عاقبتنا في الأمور كلها و... اللهم أحسن عاقبتنا في الأمور كلها وأجرنا من خذ الدنيا ومن عذاب الآخرة اللهم طهر قلوبنا من النفاق وأعمالنا من الرياء وألسنتنا من الكذب وأعيننا من الخيانة إنك تعلم خائنة الأعين وما تخفي الصدور الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله for the beautiful gift of Islam Allah chose us to be Muslims الحمد لله and الحمد لله Allah chose us to be the followers of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم what uh, what better gift can that be سبحان الله um, as usual, we will have a recap of the previous session two weeks ago, or the part two of the Battle of Uhud. And um, we would like you to join in, inshallah. If you'd like to comment in the chat section, you can do that. Um, and we will allow the floor and the host to continue, inshallah. Bismillah. Islam, brother Jah. Um, yeah, I'll give it a go. It'll be very, very basic. What do you sign in state? So, uh, the army, um, they had, they had two roles in the army. There was a left, right, and a right, left flank, and a right flank. Um, they had infantry, they had foot soldiers, and they had the archers as well. Uh, before the battle started, um, one of the leaders of the Quraysh um, said to the, was it Bani Abdul Dar, who was holding the banner, um, they reminded them about the previous battle when they were fighting, that the banner was, the banner had fallen. Um, he said something quite intimidating to them, which was to keep, keep it held up um, or to give the, uh, the responsibility to someone else, which embraced them quite a bit. Um, something else that happened just before as well was um, was uh, a message was given to the Ansar to stay um, stay away from the battle. Um, Hello, so, sorry, one second. Hello. They wanted them to stay away and not um, because they wanted to fight their own people. And also, from the Makanavi, they, they also had women on their side as well, enticing their men to fight and uh, telling them that they won't be welcoming them if they did not you know, fight bravely. Uh, during the battle, um, the banner of the Makanavi was dropped. It was a defeat for the Muslims. Um, the Muslim army were seeking victory and martyrdom. One of the uh, companions, Abu Jujana, he had the red bandana. Red bandana. He, he was everywhere on the field. He was fighting very bravely and killed a lot of the opposition. Um, in, the, in one instance, there was an opening to kill a woman, him. But he didn't kill her out of respect for women. Um, towards the end of the battle, um, Hamza radiallahu um, anhu, who was fighting very bravely, was assassinated by an uh, Abyssinian slave in the Mokan army, Washi. Um, he was given the offer of being manumitted as a slave if he was able to kill Hamza radiallahu anhu, and he did successfully do that. Um, but then later on, in his life, he did become Muslim. Um, that's as much as can remember, bro. Allah, Akbar, Jazakallah khair, brother Dildar. Anyone else want to contribute, inshallah? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, as I mentioned about the um, about Tujana, we know that many um, uh, prominent uh, Sahaba, including Ali bin Abi Talib, Abu Anna Zubair bin Al Awam, Umar bin Al Khattab, and others were there. Uh, who, you know, who were there for the taking of the sword, but the, the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave it to Abu Tujana to to strike the faces of the enemy until the sword bent, um, and then he he you know he committed. To, to give him the sword is due, um, and he, he he also does a, you know strutting about proudly and uh, the Prophet mm-hmm. mentioned that you know this type of walking is disliked by Allah except in such a situation. So uh, yeah, he took the red red uh, uh, band uh, around his around his head. Forget about Rambo, we had our own soldier with the red band around his head. Yeah. Allah Akbar. Excellent. Yes, Subhanallah. It's amazing how Abu Dujana uh, uh, took that and, and the people noticed him and and they were moving away from him and then he was killing people and then he raised his sword the, the Prophet's sword وسلم, and then he heard a shriek it was a lady and he did not want to disrespect the sword of the Prophet وسلم, subhanallah but there are a great many other lessons alhamdulillah I'll give you brothers uh, another few more minutes, inshallah, before we start today's session. Anyone else want to contribute today? What do, okay, I can ask you a question. Then. From the um, example of Abu Dujana and the uh, the comments made by Zubair that he was really upset that he did he wasn't given the sword, and we find how Zubair was like that. From amongst the Sabiqun, you know, those who race towards the uh, f- uh, front to do the best of deeds. From the early days in Mecca and throughout his life, and many of the Sahaba were like that. What do we remember? What do we take from the previous lesson about the Sabiqun, my brothers? Bismillah. They, they all wanted to race to, to be the best. Um, you know, in terms of the in terms of the iman and the belief, and, and come forward. Uh, you know, the the, the iman was not um, shaken. Uh, you know, but even by the by the sense of war, uh, it wasn't their fight. They were fighting the Quraysh. Um, they were not, you know, um, shaken by this. Uh, even though they were, you know, told to step down, and alhamdulillah, they were they were, they were at the forefront of the fighting. Allah. Alhamdulillah, and they all 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 would do. Willing to sacrifice their own uh, personal desires to, to be at the forefront and be the best. Excellent, excellent, brother Bilal. Once again, Jazakumullah khairan for those contributions and Jazakumullah khairan everyone. Wakaspai, did you want to add anything? No. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Subhanallah. Um, These uh, stories from Battle of Uhud um, are of great importance and we will see after the end of these um, stages and especially after the life of the Prophet Sallallahu we find great many lessons from the battles in particular. We will come to this insha'Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, as Brother Moshe mentioned, today is the 36th lesson. Just wanted to remind everyone, including myself, how important it is for us to do contribute um, to sorry to continue to work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it's on a small small scale because indeed Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi said the most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those deeds which are consistent even if they are small. One of our brothers, Brother Raja, he just commented on Facebook that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade us from that walk that Abu Dujana radiallahu anhu he walked in he strutted and he walked in a way that we find most of us walk in these days uh, and alhamdulillah brother bilal also mentioned that jazakumullah khairan brother uh, raja for sharing that so j- coming back to today's session again i just want to remind everyone how important it is for us to continue an amal or a'mal a deed or deeds and conclude it and finish it inshallah so our aim and objective is to complete the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and take as many and derive as many benefits from the series inshallah so like we remember from the previous session uh, that's where we ended the death of hamza the mighty warrior and the uncle of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who was given 
the title Asadullah wa Asadur Rasul, the line of Allah and the line of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And after his death, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi called him and gave him the title Sayyid al-Shuhada, the leader of all the martyrs, Allahu Akbar. Can you imagine him walking in the Day of Judgment, holding on to the throne of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu Akbar, and all the shuhada behind him. So there are many, many heroes of today who are chasing for that great title of becoming shuhada fi sabidillah. Shaheed fi sabirillah, so that they can be resurrected and be amongst the party or the group of the shuhada who will be who will be led by none other than Asadullah wa Asadur Rasul, Sayyid Shuhada, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhum. This is why we make the dua, Allah marzukna shahada fi sabirik, wa Allah grant us, bestow upon us martyrdom in the way of, in, in your way, in your path, because this is indeed one of the greatest way to end our life, inshallah. And as we mentioned, Briefly, and Brother Bilal also mentioned how Wahshi was that individual who killed uh, Hamza Radhul, not face to face, rather he sneaked and he waited for his opportunity to strike with his spear when Hamza Radhul was not looking, when he was fighting ferociously against his foe. And thereafter, he we also spoke about the narration by Wahshi later on when he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he gave it a whole account because the Prophet asked him, how did you kill my uncle? And after the whole account and the story was narrated to, uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told and uh, requested Wahshi to not come in the sight of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because every time he would see him, he would remember the death and eventual mutilation of his beloved uncle Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib may Allah be pleased with him. And what uh, happened afterwards, we find Wahshi became a Muslim and he was really affected by this because of the Prophet Sallallahu saying, I don't want to see you again. I don't want to see your face. Wahshi radiallahu anhu now, affected by these words of the Prophet Sallallahu he wanted to make amends. What he did was with that same spear, which he killed the greatest of the men, he killed the greatest of the enemies of Allah. Musallam al kazzab years later, he is the man who claimed to be a prophet during the time of the Prophet if I'm not mistaken, years later and will we speak about this inshallah in due course. Similarly, we find another Sahabi Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib, one of the cousins of the Prophet who became a Muslim years later, right at the end of the Prophet's life. What happened? He now um, meets the Prophet as a Muslim, but the Prophet said, I don't want to see you. I don't. I, he turns away, so he doesn't even communicate, converse with his companion, who was a cousin brother of his. They grew up and played together, subhanAllah. And now the Prophet is looking at him who fought with him all those years in, the, in his life, subhanAllah, in Islam. What Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith does, he is affected, like, just like Wahshi, he's affected by the words of the Prophet and he wants to make amends for his mistakes and for the wrongs and the sins that he's committed. The Prophet once called Aisha, his wife, to come look at that person. And he, he sees Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith, not Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith, Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith leaving the masjid. The Prophet tells his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, you see, that, you see that man, that individual? He's the first one to enter the masjid and the last one to leave the masjid. Allahu Akbar. Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith now making amends by becoming of those who loved and frequented the masjid. So we need to be also of those who make amends from our mistakes of the past and of those who love the masajid amongst many of the other deeds. I mean, the situation now, if you remember, is under control of the Muslims. How? Even though the death of Hamza who took place, the Muslim was still influencing the battle. Influencing the battle so much because of the way the Prophet وسلم, strategically um, placed his army, placed his men, some on the arch, uh, some on the, the archers on the on the smaller mountain ahead, just slightly ahead of us, ahead of them, and then behind them was the mountain, and the only pathway towards them to fight them was a narrow path between the two smaller mountains. Subhanallah, and this reason, this was the reason why the Qurayshi army could not inflict heavy uh, attacks on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims. So they had they had to come in a smaller, um, uh, you know, uh, attack smaller attacks, and this way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims were. Um, uh, in a greater position because they were ferocious fighters, they were very stern and they were very very much keen in this uh, and desiring the martyrdom of victory in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And during this time we have to remember some great heroes were still on the battlefield even though Hamza radiallahu passed on. We had Abu Bakr Siddiq 
عمر بن الخطاب علي بن ابو طالب زبير بن الاوام طلحة بن عبيد الله سعد بن ابو وقاص عبد الرحمن بن عوف and many other great sahaba from the ansar like abu dujana sa'd ibn mu'ad anas ibn nadr many of them were still there fighting ferociously and they were known to be of those who were great warriors on the battlefield allahu akbar and they were fighting so effectively that they broke the resolve of the quraysh the quraysh was so badly affected by these heroes subhanallah let's go to the archers the squad of archers archers what happened was Khalid, he attempted three times to attack the, the Prophet through the archers. And the archers managed to dis, um, disperse the, uh, uh, the Khalid's attacks. Alhamdulillah. And this shows again the Prophet's um, uh, plan and masterful uh, genius way he thinks, subhanAllah, in the battlefield. Allahu Akbar. And now the Mushrikeen now begin to feel and sense defeat. The Mujahideen, the Muslims are fighting ferociously keep what they kept on pushing the enemies out of their territory that land that little bit of land and you see the mushrikeen now retreating even though they were outweighing the muslims greatly as well as the the armory they had and the weapons and the equipment they had subhanallah and if you remember one third of the muslim army left because of abdullah ibn Ubay, the chief of the munafiqeen and his people from the 900 odd companions or 1,000 old companions who came to fight one third of them left if you remember in the first session we spoke about this all the standard bearers like we remember in the previous session all the standard bearers from the Quraysh the Banu Abdar were killed every one of them were killed and many of them were killed because of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib Allahu Akbar so now their flag is on the ground their their resolve has been crushed and you see men fleeing some towards the mountains their pride and dignity gone it really felt like the Muslims were the larger army and the Quraysh were the smaller army. Allahu Akbar, how things change. But we know things do change even after that. Allah sent down His help to the Muslims and verified His promise to them. They chased the Mushrikeen who fled their camp. This was no doubt a certain defeat. Abdullah ibn Zubayr, the son of Zubayr who narrates that his father Zubayr says, By Allah, I was watching the service of Hind bint Utbah, the female uh, uh, participant of Battle of Uhud, who was the wife of the leader of the Qurayshi army, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. He says that Abu Zubayr says, I saw Hind bint Utbah and her friends fleeing with their garments gathered up. And no one was able to, no one was there to prevent us from catching them. SubhanAllah, this shows that they were able to catch the women, but they did not do so. And this is narrated in Sahih Bukhari. al bari ibn Azib, one of the great com uh, companions who narrated many ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ. He relates, when we fought them, so he was there at Battle of Uhud, they fled and their women could be seen fleeing into the mountains with their ankles and their legs exposed. Allahu Akbar. This is again mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Then the Muslim warriors on the battlefield started collecting the booty. And this is where the problem began. When the Muslims now... Uh, on, a on a very advantageous position chasing away the enemies picking up the booty what happens next is very very critical the archers made a fatal mistake subhanallah the archers made a fatal mistake that small army the prop uh, army of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was recording their second um, absolute victory over their enemies the quraysh and again the splendor of it the glory of it was recorded up until then. Majority of the archers on that mountain, unfortunately, they committed a major mistake, a fatal mistake. They turned the whole, this turned the whole situation, subhanAllah. The whole situation now is upside down. This led to the very reason why the Muslims were inflicted the heavy losses, subhanAllah. Not to mention what will come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be also uh, affected physically because of the mistakes of the archers. Because the mistakes of the archers, because of the instructions that they were given, they did not follow those instructions. And we will go into some of these lessons very, very briefly in a bit. We have already spoken about the strict orders the Prophet Sallallahu gave them to hold their positions whenever, whatever the course uh, the battle takes. You know, even if they were seen pecking on crows, meaning if the Muslim bodies were seen, crows were coming and pecking the uh, pecking on their bodies, you should not go to them. 
We spoke about this in the previous session. But in spite of that, and the leader's warning, the leader was Abdullah ibn Jubayr, who was the leader of those archers. He warned them, but 40 of his men from that small mountain, the archers, they left their, arch, their position. And what happened was, this now enticed the enemies, especially Khalid ibn Walid, the great military general who spotted that. What happened was, before we speak about this, we speak about why they left. They left because of the booty. And they left because they wanted to be part of the victory. So two things. The victory was not complete. The battle was not has not ended. But they thought they have um, finished off their enemies. So what we re learn from this is we don't um, become overjoyous of our um, small victories in our lives. Rather, we seek Allah's forgiveness, attribute that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah wants to... Um, Honor us, he honors us. If Allah wants to dishonor us and humble us, it's up to him. So for us to be safe, for us to be safe from being dishonored and, you know, uh, being embarrassed of that dishonor, like some of the Sahaba uh, felt afterwards, then we need to be of those who are humble, not become of those who roar victory when the battle is not over. Second thing is, second thing is they also wanted the booty, dunya. They... Can I ask one of the... Yeah. Jazakallah khair. The other thing was they were after the dunya. The dunya um, uh, blinded them. They saw the booty on the ground picked up by the Muslims who were fighting on the battlefield while they were on the mountainside. They came down to join in and get the dunya. Subhanallah. And that was the fatal mistake. Again, the dunya is the thing that takes us away from Al-Akhirah. You cannot have both the dunya and the Akhirah. Allahu Akbar. This is why we need to practice zuhud, which is ascetism or explaining that we can say chasing the chasing the Akhirah and shunning the dunya. You know, we will cover these sort of uh, terminology again in the future. But for now, we should remember these are very important concepts in our deen. Zuhud is something that we should learn and try and practice. And the person who practices that is a zahid. So Khalid ibn Walid um, now spots nine men remain on that battle on on the small a uh, small mountain, and he with his sharp mindedness and his military genius, he he pierces through, and all of the men on that small battle uh, on that small uh, um, mountain the mountain of archers are killed, including their leader Abdullah ibn Jubair. May Allah be pleased with them all. Amin ya Rabb. So now Khalid goes behind the mountain now. He goes behind that small mountain and right behind the Muslims where the Muslims were camping. Subhanallah. And this bewildered the Muslims so much because their way was now exposed and now the Muslims are not only facing their enemies at the front but now they are facing their enemies at the back because of that fatal mistake of the archers. This gives us the major lesson of Samia'na wa ata'ana. We hear and we obey. The concept of listening and following instructions, especially in Islamically in an Islamic organization, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordering the believers, Ya Ayyuhaladina Amanu, Ati Allah wa Ati al Rasul, all you who believe. So again, these verses remember is directed towards the believers. So the believers should pay extra attention to these verses. All you believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And those who have been given authority over you are ulil amri minkum. And then if you differ in anything, then return back to Allah and His Messenger. There are many lessons about this. We spoke some of it right in the beginning about obeying Allah and His Messenger. And the, and the, uh, and the consequences of not following Allah and His Messenger. One of which we can remind each other, everyone here, is when uh, I think Imam Malik rahimahullah mentions that the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi is like the Ark of Nuh alayhi salam. Whoever is following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, is upon the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, is saved and whoever disobeys him he is drowned and he is dis destroyed when Khalid at that time obviously he's not a Muslim I'm, ca I'm calling him Khalid and may Allah be pleased with him because he does become a Muslim afterwards and he's one of the heroes of Islam 
I easily say radiallahu because he was one of our great heroes in Islam. So when he uh, defeats Abdullah ibn Jubayr and comes to the rear, he calls that to the Quraysh. Allah, uh, he calls that to the men of the Quraysh. And when they hear their voices, this also encouraged those who were retreating to come back for a counter-attack. Now these men are coming back. The mushrikeen, even the women came back, rushing back to the battlefield. And one of them even raised the banner. The banner that was on the ground that was crushed, she picks it up. And with that, all the men of the Quraysh who were retreating, they come back next to the banner and they re-attack and have a counter-attack attack against the Muslims. And while that was taking place, we find the Muslim now encircled because of the numbers of the Quraysh as well as the, P the Quraishi army led by Khalid ibn Walid and his men at the rear and now they are encircled, Allahu Akbar. So the situation is very grave now. Amongst them is our leader Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who is now trapped and encircled between all the enemies of Allahum, Allahum Sa'an. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is now left with a small group of fighters, nine in number, at the rear of the army. So Khalid ibn Walid surprised the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and now forces the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to make one of the two choices. Either he Sallallahu Alaihi flees the battlefield and abandons the Muslims or he risks his life and rallies the Muslims, calls out to the Muslims to join his ranks. And this will consequently, you know, bring about the Mushrikeen, the Mushrikeen because they'll hear his voice and they'll recognize his voice and they will come and attack him because he was their main target, the leader of the Muslims, Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we find the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the bravest of all men and the most smartest military general ever in history succeeded in his moves, Allahu Akbar. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raised his voice, calling his companions, Ya Ibadullah, O servants of Allah. And where he knew that the mushrikeen will hear his voice and they will attack him. And he was also rallying the Muslim to come and join him. The mushrikeen did become the first to, join, uh, to hear his voice and come towards him and attack him as he was their target. And that's what happened. The mushrikeen now reached, the, reached him before the Muslims have. Subhanallah. Now the situation is becoming extremely grave and very critical. And remember why this happened? Because some Muslims did not follow instructions, left their positions. Instead of saying Samia wa Atana, they said Samia wa Asaina, the booty, we're going for the booty, the dunya, we're going for the dunya. We don't hear and obey. Rather, we say we, we say we say we hear and we disobey. This is what happened. This is the reason why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is now facing an enemy. At the uh, at the uh, uh, at the rear as well as in front of him, Subhanallah. The Muslims now in a very weakened position. One group of Muslims fled the scene. Another group returned to the battlefield, but mixed with the mushrikeen so much that they could not even recognize one another, Subhanallah. Consequently, unfortunately, some Muslims were killed by mistake, and you can imagine now the utter confusion. Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari rahimullah collected this hadith by Aisha radiallahu who said on the day of Uhud the mushrikeen were utterly defeated. Iblis then called out, O servants of Allah, beware the rear, i.e. the enemy is approaching from behind. So those who were at their front turned back and fought the ones who were behind. Then Huzaifa radiallahu anhu caught sight of his father. father. His father was al yaman was a Muslim and he was about to be attacked without notice, without being recognized as a Muslim by the Muslims, by some Muslims and they killed him and before they were killing him he was saying oh servants of Allah beware that's my father beware this is my father he repeated that but they killed him Huzaifa ibn al-Yaman says may Allah forgive you and Urwa uh, the son of Zubair radiallahu he narrates that from uh, that Aisha radiallahu his auntie was Aisha radiallahu who says that for, um, by Allah, from that time onwards, Huzaifa radiallahu has always been blessed and wealthy until he died. Because he forgave the Muslims and he did not want any blood money. Rather, the blood money, he said, give it fi sabilillah. Spend it in the, to, uh, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in charity. 
So the Muslim now suffer suffering immense uh, loss, great bewilderment and disorder. Again, we have to be reminded why? Because of those who left the physicians at the mountains of the archers and now all of this difficulty because of them. Subhanallah. Many Muslims got lost. They did not know where to go. And at this awkward time, some were calling out the words, Muhammad is dead, Muhammad has been killed. And this news made it even more hard for those companions. Some became senseless, some dropped their weapons. Some were thinking of even going to uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, the chief of the Munafiqeen, and to speak to Ab Abu uh, Sufyan to make a uh, pact that they have retreated and they have, uh, you know, given up subhanallah Anas ibn Nadr anhu, the uncle of Anas ibn Malik he passed by some of these individuals who he saw dropping their, um, their weapons and being senseless and bewildered he says what are you doing what are you waiting for they said to him Muhammad has been killed he said what do you live for then after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam Come and die for what Allah's Messenger died for. Allahu Akbar. These were the great leaders of the Ummah who showed their and displayed their courage and instinct in how to be brave men of Islam at, the, at those critical times. Anas ibn Nadr he makes a dua. Ya Allah, I apologize for what these Muslims have done. And I swear a disavowal of what the Mushrikeen have perpetrated. Then he moved and passed and he met the great companion Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad al-Ansari the great companion Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad uh, who we spoke about him many times he was a very uh, brave warrior and a leader of the Ansar and he says to uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad where to Ya Abu Umar sorry Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad calls um, Anas ibn Nadr whose nickname was uh, Abu Umar he says where are you going Ya Abu Umar Anas radiallahu he replies, Ah, how fine the scent of paradise is. I smell it behind Uhud. I smell it here in Uhud. I smell it here in Uhud. Subhanallah. He went on to fall. He went on and fought against the mushrikeen, the enemies, until he was killed. Allahu Akbar. Nobody, nobody could recognize him except his sister after the battlefield. Subhanallah. They find over 80 wounds on his body. 80 wounds on his body and his sister recognized him by the tip of his finger subhanallah because no one could recognize his mutilated wounded body radiallahu anhu and we'll speak about him again a little later inshallah because the con the stories of the shuhada doesn't end there because we know allah subhanallah says do not say do not so do not even think those who have been killed in the path of allah as dead but rather they are alive receiving and rejoicing in the provisions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, we will speak about this in, in the latter state, um, in, the, in the very near future. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad who narrates regarding this incident when he bumped into Anas ibn Nadr, he said, what I saw from Anas ibn Nadr, I could never do myself. And he's saying this because he knew, and the Ummah knew, Anas uh, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was a very courageous warrior. But he said there was a man who was more brave, more courageous, more stern, more strong than him. And that was Anas ibn Nadr. And he was, again, the uncle of the great Anas ibn Malik, who was one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Sallallahu who narrated many a hadith. And his nickname was Khadmi Rasul. Subhanallah, the servant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thabit ibn Ad-Dahda, radiyallahu he calls out to his people, O oh, kinsfolk of Ansar. So he was an Ansari companion from Medina. If Muhammad has been killed, Allah is everlasting and he never dies. Fight in defense of Iman. Allah will help you and you will be victorious. Allah Akbar. Look at the words of these men. Look at the words of these men. These men knew that they were not worshippers of Muhammad, but rather they were worshippers of Allah. And they loved Allah more than they loved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But to love Allah, they needed to show that love through the message, through the teachings and loving Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, through the teachings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and loving him. And we will find other companions narrating this same words or uttering the same words like Musab ibn Umayr. But now is not the time. A group of Al-Ansar, 
joined Abu Dahda, Thabit ibn Dahda, and attacking Khalid's battalion. While they attacked him, uh, attacking the horsemen, one by one they fell as martyrs. Of all the Ansari, subhanallah. A muhajir who was passing by, Ansar, by an Ansari, who was covered and dripping with blood, he said, Oh my brother, Ya Akhib, have you heard of Prophet Sallallahu killing? He answered, if Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is killed, then his, uh, then he must have completed the delivery of his message. So fight in the defense of Islam. Again, these were the words of not only the Ansar, but the Muhajirin as well. Of Muhajirin as well. These were the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhanallah, the leaders of the Ummah, whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do not, do not, belit, do not um, uh, de degrade or do not, Say things of negativeness towards my companions. Subhanallah. If one of you was to spend a mountain uh, eagle of oh, mountain worth of gold in the in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, spend it that would know that would not even compare to a hand span or a little bit like this if they spent it in, in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the companions of the Prophet sallallahu were held in high regard by by not by the Prophet sallallahu only. But Allah as well. This is why Allah com com uh, commonly calls them radiyallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with them. It, also, it has to be mentioned as well. They, they now resisted the idea of going to Abdullah ibn Ubay. They started thinking about this. But when... The Muslims started regaining their morale. They dropped the idea. And they wanted to join the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because they heard the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Muslims, oh Muslims. And they fought with immense courage, skill and Iman. The third group, the third group of Muslims were those who cared for nothing except the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhanallah. And at the head of them was none other than Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and other notable companions like Umar, Ali, Zubair, Talha, hastening to protect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this has to be mentioned that they showed unrivaled devotion. Unrivaled devotion to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the battle intensif intensifies around the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As the groups of Muslims were receiving blows of the idolaters, the mushrikeen, instant, uh, instantly resisting the fighting, the fight flared up. It became very intense, very intense, especially around the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who had only nine people around him. I've mentioned some of the names. I believe Abu Dujana was one of those as well. A violent struggle, intense struggle broke out between these nine Muslims and the Mushrikeen with pe which peerless love, self-sacrifice, bravery and heroism were revealed. We find that Abu Dujana anhu, at that time, his description was like a porcupine because he was protecting the Prophet with his back and his back was full of arrows. We find Talha anhu, half of his body became paralyzed because of him protecting the Prophet We find the Prophet calling out uh, to the believers later on to the believers saying Talha anhum, whoever wants to see a living martyr then look at Talha anhum. he says the whole day of Uhud belongs to Talha anhum. Talha anhum even caught, uh, picked up the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on his body and he carried him because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was injured he was bleeding Subhanallah that was how critical and dangerous that situation was Anas ibn Malik narrated that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam along with seven helpers and, emigrant, and two immigrants who were confined to a trap when the Mushrikeen attacked him Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says He who pushes back those idolaters, this Mushrikeen, these Mushrikeen will be in paradise Subhanallah One of the helpers, one of the Ansar stepped forward and fought the Mushrikeen in defense of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was killed Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was attacked again the same process was repeated by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and one by one, seven of these Ansari companions were killed. SubhanAllah. We have not done justice to our companions, said these, uh, the, the remaining Muslims amongst the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The last of those helpers was, by the way, Umara 
Ibn Yazid, Ibn Asakhan, we need to mention these names to remember these names because these were those individuals who protected our Prophet. Don't we find today the name of the Prophet being attacked? Don't we find today how these people, these very lowly people, they try to degrade our Rasul? If our companions were living today, if the companions of the Prophet lived today, how would their response be? Subhanallah. How would they defend the honor of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? This was the most awkward time, the most awkward hour in the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters. This was the most dangerous time where his life was threatened. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remained alone with only those two Qurayshis, SubhanAllah. And according to Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Uthman said, at that time there were none with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except Talha ibn Ubaidillah and Sa'd ibn, Sa ibn Abu Waqas, both of these men, by the way, are two of the ten blessed companions that Al-Ashratul Mubashir, who were given the glad tidings of paradise, they were from the, from the Meccan companions. And Sa'd ibn Abu Waqas, we've mentioned him a number of times, as well as Talha ibn Abaydillah. Sa'd ibn Abu Waqas was one of the cousins of, of the Prophet, وسلم, one of the uncle of the Prophet, وسلم, and he was a young companion as well. The Prophet وسلم, gave him an arrow and said, Shoot! Oh Sa'ad, may, mother, may my mother and father be sacrificed for you. And he repeated that so many times. Some of the narrators say that he mentioned that ten times. Some of them narrate that he mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned these, these words, uttered these words hundred times to show that Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqas radiyallahu anhu was given this, these words, the, 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 the glad tidings of these words and no other companion was were given these glad tidings, subhanAllah. This was a golden opportunity for, for the Mushrikeen to finish the Prophet off. This was their time and they took advantage of it. They concentrated their attack on the Prophet وسلم, looking forward to killing him subhanAllah. They pelted th uh, stones at him as well subhanAllah. Stones that, that, uh, that attacked and hurt the Prophet's face that he was bleeding subhanAllah. His noble face was bleeding, his lips were cut. And his incisor tooth was injured. His head was injured, subhanAllah. There were different, different people who were different Qurayshi um, uh, warriors. They attacked the Prophet and he was bleeding, subhanAllah. Even the Prophet's shoulders was uh, injured. And for he mentioned that for a month he was not able to... Um, carry himself properly subhanallah that's after the battle of Uhud for a month can you imagine the inflict the injuries inflicted on the on our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam can you imagine that can you imagine how much physically he was hurt subhanallah from his armor the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam armor it you know uh, uh, blue, blue, uh, his cheek was uh, damaged and dis um, affected to an ex extent that he was hurt so much Two of the chains or two of the rings of his iron ringed helmet penetrated into his cheek and was bleeding. He was bleeding so much that Allah's Messenger وسلم, while he was wiping the blood flowing from his face, he was uttering the dua, I beg Allah to humiliate you. In another narration, the Al in, in the by Bukhari Muslim, it was stated that when the, when the incisor broke and his head was injured and he started wiping the blood off, off it, he was saying, how can a people cut the face of the, their Prophet وسلم, and break his teeth? He calls them to worship Allah. How can such a people thrive or be successful? Thereafter, about this incident, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse, correcting the Prophet وسلم. What did he say? لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ أَوْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَوْ يُعَذِّبَهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ Not for you, O Muhammad وسلم, is the decision whether he turns in mercy to pardon them or punish them, verily they are the Adhalimun. This is Surah Ali Imran, verse one to eight. At Tabarani, one of the famous uh, scholars of Islam, states that the Prophet ﷺ said, "Allah's wrath is great on those who wounded his face," and he observed his silence for a short while, then resumed, saying. Allah li qawmi innahum fa innahum la ya'lamu oh Allah forgive my people for they don't know subhanallah look at the humility and the softness and his character and his beautiful character that he makes for dua for those people who is hurting 
Subhanallah. In Sahih Muslim, it's narrated that the Prophet said, Rabbi khfilli qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. So there is different narrations regarding this dua by the different companions. And one of the dua he mentioned is, Wallah, guide my people for they have no knowledge. They have no knowledge. Coming back to those two companions, uh, um, Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqas and Talha ibn Ubaidillah, they were the only two companions who were with the Prophet at that time. But then Abu Bakr Siddiq, he, he, he sees the Prophet and he comes running to protect the Prophet as well as trying to take off the, 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 inj, the, the two iron rings from his face. And while he was doing that, another great companion, Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, one of the other ten blessed companions of the Prophet who were given the glad tent to paradise where they were alive. He comes running and he urges, he pleads with Abu Bakr Siddiq not to uh, do that, but rather let him do that. Abu Ubaidah radhi anhu, he with his own mouth, with his teeth, takes off the iron ring from the Prophet's face very carefully, not to hurt and inflict any more further pain to the Prophet while it was bleeding at the same time. At that time, Abu Ubaidah radhi anhu's inside the teeth comes out. And then the second iron ring that was also uh, attached to the Prophet's face. Abu Bakr again wanted to take that off himself. Abu Ubaidah pleads and urges that he should do so. And while he does that, Abu Ubaidah radhi anhu again does that with very careful uh, and tenderness. Subhanallah, his other inside the teeth comes out. And Abu Ubaidah now looks at Abu Bakr radhi anhu with his two t- front teeth off his face. Subhanallah. Abu Bakr radiallahu says, Subhanallah, this man was a very beautiful man, even with his two teeth not on his in, uh, front two teeth out. Subhanallah, Allahumma sallam. These were the love of these acts of devotion were how the Sahaba showed the love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi And we we don't really have time to, to speak about it much right now, but there are obviously much more than what we have covered. There were other incidents that have been spoken about, and there are, this book. This book is a very very basic book. Um, still nectar and we can only remind, remind ourselves that we should actually go back to the book and other literature and other talks to understand and grasp as much as possible from these great battles because the devotion and the acts of devotion and the courage and, the, and their utterances and the sacrifices by the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu were unequal, unrivaled and this is why we need to take lessons as well as the major lesson that we take is why the Prophet was bleeding is because of those archers they did not do Samiyana wa Ta'ana they did Samiyana wa Asayna they did not hear and obey rather they heard and they disobeyed this is why the Prophet was bleeding this is why Muslims were killed and there were about 70 who died in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this I will end inshallah hopefully in a couple of weeks time we will resume with our Seed Nectar series um, it will be in Ramadan, possibly. Uh, we will I- inform you and update you, inshallah. I'll bring it, bring Brother uh, Moshir in it back back and, and to uh, conclude, inshallah. And anyone want to comment or raise any question for myself or Brother Moshir, we will try to uh, answer them and respond to them. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم سبحان ربك رب العزة ما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Um, any questions, please uh, forward them now or unmute yourself and ask uh, Zakar by yourself. No? Um, Gabriel Ocas? Yes, so, um, is that right? The, so the Battle of Oz, like, would it, would it be considered a, a loss in terms of military or would you say it's a draw still? Because obviously, I mean, not the most intentional retreat in the end. Um, would, would you consider it a loss? Is the question. Jazakallah, khayyam, brother Waqas. This is one of the uh, um, common questions, subhanAllah. Bismillah, Bismillah, Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Salatu wa Salam, Al Rasulillah. Allah actually speaks about this uh, at great length. And the scholars have also spoken about this. Was this a victory or was this a loss, a defeat? Surah Ali Imran, the last portion of Surah Ali Imran speaks about the Battle of Uhud. And we find the scholars 
informing us because of the lessons learned from Battle of Uhud and the victory of martyrdom by the companions because they gained martyrdom. This was a victory, not in the dunya sense, but rather for the Ummah up until Yawm Al Qiyamah because the Quranic verses were revealed regarding those incidents and many lessons were learned. And we will speak about some of these verses inshallah when we cover uh, the, the battle because the battle is not finished. As well as we find some of the verses are revealed because of the shuhada. There are immense, immense lessons. But one of the great lessons that we take from this, and the scholars say that this was indeed a victory, is because of the mistakes that was made. Because of the mistakes, these mistakes became gems. These mistakes became the reason why this, the scholars say this was a victory. Allahu A'lam. But I'm not sure you can add a few, uh, few of your thoughts, inshallah. Yeah, I was just going to add as well. Um, yeah. We shouldn't forget that, alhamdulillah, because of this battle, we also um, inherited, or we, um, Allah SWT guided one of the biggest pillars uh, of, of soldiers of Islam, which is Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. After, after this battle, obviously, he, um, his heart was eventually gradually sort of guided to Islam. And as we know, he's one of the few uh, figures in, in history of mankind who have never lost a battle within, uh, uh, within any of his battles. So, alhamdulillah. Um, that's another victory that we could take from uh, Battle of Uhud. Generally speaking, the Muslims didn't really lose the battle. It was only because of one mistake that uh, certain Muslims made. And one thing we have to understand is that that lesson had to be taught to, to mankind. Um, and if it wasn't taught, then Islam wouldn't have progressed in the way that they did. Because if you think about it, if they had won and the Muslims were successful in gaining the beauty, then you would have find that most Muslims would have been inclined to just basically focusing on booty, and and and, like war, and they would this would have probably become one of their purposes of entering uh, into war and fighting for the sake of Allah, rather than actually for the sake of Allah. Subhanahu wa taala, would have been made, like mixed with this uh, this greed for for inheriting the world as well. But Alhamdulillah, Allah Subhanahu wa taala kept the the iman of the Muslims firm after this um, temporary sort of setback that they they um, faced. And they were reminded again that it's not Allah SWT, sorry, it's not the worldly booty that we're going for, it's to raise Allah SWT's words and uh, to make sure that, you know, uh, we, uh, Islam is established uh, in its entirety. So uh, that's, that's one of the biggest lessons that we learned from this. Uh, any other questions before we end it, brothers? Because uh, I'm aware that the Maghrib is in within like four minutes or so. Uh, let's see. Okay, nothing on the chat either. Okay, so we'll end it here, inshallah. Next, uh, in the next two weeks, we'll um, come back for our 37th session. Um, and, uh, you know, please do keep an eye out on the message and share it to the brothers and sisters who have mutual, who will benefit from this. Uh, we'll that, we'll we'll that, we'll end it. Assalamu alaikum. خالد سيف لنا قائد وها هو خالد سيف لنا قائد كم زلزل الأقدام من كافر حاشد كم زلزل الأقدام من كافر حاشد وها هو خالد سيف لنا قائد